Hello and welcome to the latest Royal Roundup from Talk TV. So pop the kettle on. This is the Royal Tea. I'm Sarah Hewson. On this week's show, Diana's former butler claims he has secrets to tell Prince William and Prince Harry. Prince Andrew is worried he's going to be evicted and Harry and Meghan break their silence on that South Park episode. Joining me to discuss that and plenty more, a royal commentator and Talk TV regular Afia Hagen, The Sun's royal editor Matt Wilkinson and royal commentator and Talk TV host Daisy McAndrew. Prince Andrew, as reported by Matt, is worried he'll be evicted from his £30 million home due to slashed royal budgets that would leave him struggling to afford the maintenance costs of the vast property. Now, Matt, he'd been given a quarter of a million pound allowance by his mother out of private funds. What's happening now? Is that going to be scrapped? Under well, King Charles? I mean, we're reaching an end game for Prince Andrew at the moment because for many years, particularly in the Queen's later years, she was ring fencing him. She was looking after him and she was funding him after he, after he left as a, as a working royal. Um, Charles is now taking over the palace purse strings. So he's now running the Duchy of Lancaster money. And we are told that in April, tax near start, ta new tax year starts, he will be saying to his brother, I cannot afford to pay you the same amount of money as my mother did. Now that means that he will struggle to fund his life, struggle to pay for the upkeep of Royal Lodge, a 30 million pound house in Windsor. And if he cannot afford to run it, then he feels he's gradually being eased out of this, this vast house that he thought he was gonna have for the rest of his life. And it's gonna be fascinating, isn't it, to see this unravel because if he really does end up moving out of that house, just I hate the word, but the optics of that are very, very dramatic. You know, son of the Queen being forced out of a house because, you know, admittedly, a lot of people would say because of his own actions, but officially nothing's been proved, you know, of, of his misdemeanours. And actually moving out of this house that was his grandmother's house that apparently he spent £7 million on mm. renovations. I mean, if he's to be moved out of it, if, he, if it is, you know, he thinks he might be out by September. That's how that's how how quick it could be. Um, but if he is to be moved out, it is be, it's not bec it's because he is no longer a working royal and doesn't mm. receive the funding for that lifestyle. Okay, so I mean, and it is vast, isn't it? I mean, it's a thirty-room mansion, yes, mm -hmm. huge, huge grounds, including a driving range. I, I mean, I wonder how many people will actually feel any sympathy if he has to downsize. <laughs> I mean, not a lot of people will feel any sympathy for him. And you, you very rightly said, Daisy, that nothing has been proven, um, but the allegations are still there. There's a lot of an air of there's no smoke without fire. Yeah, he can't and work, so he can't earn any e money. Exactly. Now. And he isn't a working royal, so he doesn't need that amount of money for his upkeep. He's not working to earn it, and he doesn't need this vast property. I think he just needs to quietly retire and fade into the background, not in a 30 million pound house. <laughs> but uh, it is a home that he shares with his ex-wife Sarah Ferguson. She reportedly now wants to earn the money to, to support him now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we're, look, we're going to see big changes I think this year. And that we will not be sitting here in a year's time discussing Andrew's situation as it is now. I think things will change. I think he's in a more definitive way. His yeah, role will be uh, yep, after the clear, coronation, clarified. Exactly. I think both him and Sarah are working as a team to find a way. We, we, we want him to find, as I say, we want him to go away and retire or find another job or, or, or downsize to a, to a smaller house. And I think the way things are going at the moment, he doesn't, have a, he doesn't really have a massive team. He doesn't really communicate with the palace. He doesn't have a communications officer. Mm. Okay, so all the stuff that's happening at the moment, it, it's not being spun or anything like that. These are raw facts that are coming out of, of, of Andrew's dire situation. But he is making, I, I think we will see in, in about a year's time, possibly, or even sooner than that, after the coronation, we'll see huge changes with his life, what with Sarah, with him. What about potentially eyeing up a move to the United States, which has been mooted, Daisy? I was just about to say that, in fact, I could have entertained that idea before the uh, Dufre case, before the settlement and all that, because of course he now is much more famous in the States, infamous mm -hmm. in the States than he was before. But if you cast your mind back, actually Fergie, Sarah, um, has, has earned quite a lot of money in the States. She's been you know, the spokeswoman for Weight Watchers and she's done a lot of interviews that she's been paid for. She's actually 
done okay as far as her own you know, PR and business interests in the state. So I could have seen that happening. I could have seen if he was in disgrace in the UK, but not in the States, I could have seen them going there. But at the moment, mm. I really can't. My understanding with this is that he, uh, we're told he's casting an eye over Harry and Meghan's operations. So he wants, he, he, he now has to be financially independent yep. because he's not going to get as much money from the king. So he, He's looking at how Harry and Meghan have set up Archwell. As a model. As a model. Yeah. But there's, yeah. there's really no way that he can achieve that because he has no way from w way of earning because the disgrace that is with him is going to follow him all the way around. I mean, who is going to want to employ him? Who's going to want to have him as a head of a charitable foundation? Who's going to want to set up a production company with him, for instance, to produce content? Do we want a Prince Andrew podcast? I don't think so. I, I, I completely agree. A Netflix no. series? No, I'm good, thanks. Actually, I can see, not necessarily Netflix, but I can see a broadcaster paying him to do you know a from the heart spill the beans or whatever not paying him to be an employee in the way that harry and megan have done that mm. but i can see people paying for his story but i, I mean really after, the, after the panorama car crash i guess you could look at it two ways i mean it was literally a car crash interview but if you get another one that's just as bad i suppose yeah you could have as many yeah. eyeballs on it but if you're being paid and um, to to make something where you have much more control over it in the way that harry and megan mm -hmm. have you know a documentary about him poor andrew you know wistfully looking into distance you can see that working and that not being so are advised. you telling me that a, a major broadcaster would not pay a lot of money for a flammable documentary exactly. with prince andrew yeah. and sarah ferguson exactly. in their new life in america or a new life in the middle east or something i think it would it, it does lead me on to our next subject, which is uh, the lawyer representing Prince Andrew's sex abuse accuser, Virginia Dufre, has called Ghislaine Maxwell a very damaged person. And he also told Piers Morgan he had no clue why Maxwell and Prince Andrew had spoken out publicly because it has damaged their credibility. I mean, Matt, you talked about there not being advisors uh, around him. Mm. But it, it, it certainly didn't work last time round, did it? In fact, it did un terrible damage to him. Well, this, this is what worries me now because him and his family are maybe making the decisions outside of the royal circle, outside of any um, you know, media team, you could end up with them being pushed towards another car crash uh, news night interview. That, that, is, that is a worry that I've got, yeah. Daisy, do you think it, can you see it happening? Uh, I mean, I found, I found the boys, uh, the David Boys interview really interesting. I mean, Piers Morgan obviously did, d did a very good job, but in some ways, if you take a step back from what he said, it's a kind of, well, he would say that, wouldn't he? Attitude in, in that. He earned the settlement, didn't he? You know, boys, boys were saying, Andrew's a Rogan. Well, of course he thinks Andrew's a wrong and he was fighting against him and he got a settlement. You know, he, he was saying Andrew was running scared of a court case. He would say Andrew was running scared mm. of a court case and would be a bad witness because that was part of how he managed to get that settlement. Mm. So uh, he, was, he was a really interesting interviewee, but I'm not sure he damaged Andrew. I mean, I, I, I'm sounding like an Andrew apologist. I'm not an Andrew apologist. I can just see, I, I can see, a broadcaster paying mm. for a fly on the wall documentary. I absolutely can. I don't think that they would want to relocate to the States because of the likes of David Boyes and because of the types of, of things he was saying in that interview. Well, last week, anti-monarchy protesters questioned the cost of the coronation during the King's visit to Milton Keynes. And they've said the protests will continue up until May the 6th. Matt, you were in Milton Keynes when this first protest happened. I mean, will it face the king at all? Well, no, he, he actually veered very close to the protesters. Um, they, there was a small group of about 20 people from a political group called Republic. They've not held any protests since the Queen's death that I can think of at jobs that I've, that I've been to. But they were quite vocal, they're very, very well behaved, but uh, look, it's, a, it's a free country. And I, I think the king and his organisers and, and us are more relaxed about an official designated protest group being at these events waving placards than the lone egg thrower or someone shouting out abuse you know I mean l l let's have a chat about it it's, it's a democracy some people don't want the king let them protest and let have a co uh, we're not hiding away from it the cost of the coronation is a discussion that we're going to have continuously until it happens in May so a lot of people are going to to feel the same way and there's a lot of polls suggesting um, that 
especially younger people, uh, don't necessarily see the point of having a monarchy, having a king, and it's a discussion that people want to have. And like Matt so rightly said, we are in a democracy, and people feel that it's more of an open discussion that we should have, especially, I think, after the death of Queen Elizabeth II, people that feel that it's time for a change. Exactly, and this is something that the royal family were well aware of. In all the years running up to the Queen's death, they knew that that handover from the Queen to Charles was going to be a really delicate mm -hmm. and, and tricky moment where protests would increase. So the Queen had a number of protests herself, but actually I think people slightly felt it was disrespectful to protest as she became really old into her 90s. But they always knew, the royal family always knew that those protests would ramp up when Charles took over. And I also think it's not just going to be here in the United Kingdom, it's going to be throughout the realms Commonwealth, and the Commonwealth yeah. as well. Well, as the big day approaches each week, we will update you with all the latest news and announcements coming from the palace. An anthem written by Andrew Lloyd Webber is one of 12 new pieces of music commissioned by King Charles for his coronation. The monarch has also asked for Greek Orthodox music to be played in tribute to his late father, the Duke of Edinburgh, who died in 2021. It will be performed by the Byzantine Chant Ensemble. Um, I think the music is going to play a big role in this ceremony, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And certainly something that the King is very much involved in. Yeah, definitely. You know, he's such a, a hand in sort of orchestrating for want of a better word um, these things and making sure the music is perfect and getting the best musicians possible um, to write these and perform these pieces of music but what I really want to know is and I've said this before are we going to see all five of the Spice Girls reunited on stage for the concert? The concert at Windsor Castle yes, the day after the, the coronation. Sunday. Matt, do that's you have any I insight for it? Matt. Yeah. Well, they won't be in the Abbey, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting the, the reunion back into Not the Abbey. Not going to put on their choir robes. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, look, we don't know, but there is plenty of speculation. I think there's plenty of hope that the Spice Girls... Who do, uh, do we know any confirmed names um, so well, No far. one's officially confirmed, but we've reported that Lana Ritchie's attending. And Lana Ritchie, I think he was a trustee of the Prince's Trust International. So he knows Charles, he's quite good friends with Charles. And so we're told that um, he's been approached and he's accepted. And just a reminder, if you want to enter the public ballot for tickets to that coronation concert at Windsor Castle on May the 7th, you have just one week left. It is closing on the 28th of February. Now, the Prince and Princess of Wales attended the BAFTAs on Sunday night, and they appeared to give a rare public display of affection. As they were walking down the red carpet, the Duchess of Cambridge gave Prince William a gentle tap on the behind. You were there, Afia. I was there. I was there. Um, a great night at the BAFTAs on Sunday night. All the stars were out, Angela Bassett. I knew I'd get them in there. Um, and yeah, it was lovely to see uh, Kate and William walking down the red carpet. Uh, and yeah, Kate giving an unexpected little tap on William's behind. And I mean, why not? I wouldn't necessarily have done it, but I'm happy for her. Are we, um, not, are we sure it was deliberate? It looked to me like a bit of an accident. A bit of a but hand, I, I yeah. Think, I think it depends like which angle you look at it, but royal fans went mad for yeah, it. I think they like to so pretend so that it was a nice little, a nice little tap on the a behind. A moment nice little between little moment a of couple. Affection. But do you know what I, what I didn't like? And I think this is, you know, I've talked before about how much we discuss, you know, what our royals wear mm. and especially when it comes to to Kate and Meghan the comparisons of what they wear and what one wears and what what the other one doesn't wear I personally really quite liked her outfit that she wore for the BAFTAs I love the earrings that she wore but I would, going online the day after and you know you're the best dressed and the worst dressed some of the comments and I just think you know the constant comparison between our young royals not just kate and megan eugenie and and everyone else is so boring and people have so much time to hate one because you like the other but and all industries that. grow up around this though they don't really they because do. those earrings then sold out so and are now pounds from zara, zara was, yeah. and they're now on ebay at extortionate yeah. amounts of money if you, if you remember um in spare that you mentioned about spare earlier uh, but Kate's painted, Kate and William are both painted as kind of cold in mm. that, when they, yeah. they don't hug as much, you know, they're yeah, not used yeah. to Meghan hugging and stuff like that. But I've seen 
Kate and William together on jobs. They're very professional, but some they are tactile away from the cameras. They're professional on the job and they do the job and they speak to people, but they are. They look very much like a, a couple in love. And I, I don't think it was an accident. Um, I, th I think it was quite cheeky and I think um, they, you know, uh, not something you normally see on camera. But I, I thought it was nice. I thought we got to see them being a little bit more emotional. Indeed, and but it sounds like you're sort of almost putting two and two together and say they were portrayed as very cold in the book. And then, oh, look, suddenly they're you know, pinching no, each other's I bottoms. Think it's <laughs> I, I think behind the scenes you do kind of see them being uh, giving each other lovely little looks and lovely smiles when they're on jobs. And I don't think it was, I don't think it was forced or unnatural or an accident. I, I, you know, I just thought it was a you know, I don't think she was aware and was like a little gentle pat on the bum. I think it was all right. Paul Burrell has told the Daily Mirror that he must tell Prince William and Harry some of their mother's secrets. As he prepares for prostate cancer surgery, the former royal butler says he's haunted by the memory of private moments he shared with Princess Diana when she confided in him some of her deepest secrets. He, ned he said, I know some of it isn't pretty, but if I leave this place and go somewhere else, they will never know. I mean, what kind of secrets do we think he's talking about here, Matt? I don't know. We look forward. We look forward to hearing them. I mean, does he talk to William and Harry? That's the thing. I'm I not don't sure think so. As a, no. As, a, as an open line to them, but that he was there at some of the most important times, and we know in Harry's book that he he doesn't recall much of his mother's life, and he was researching. Diana's life. So there was probably an opportunity then for Paul to talk to Harry when he was researching spare. Something. Well, Harry's very rude about Paul Burrell in mm. this book. I don't think either of them are particularly close to so. Paul these days. Yeah, and that is, that's the thing, you're absolutely right. It doesn't seem that there's a line of communication open between Paul Burrell and William and there's Harry. There's not going to be when Paul Burrell is prepared to go and do interviews yeah. and, and things, is there? Because yeah. that is a no-go, isn't it? If yeah. you're prepared to speak out about them, then you mm. don't have a relationship privately. It's one or the, or other. the other. More on Prince Harry now because his legal fight for his security in the UK has cost taxpayers £300,000. Matt, you wrote about this uh, this week. What can you tell us? Where are we in the process? Well, it's just dragging on and on. Mm. And this is the problem. Um, there's an irony here because he said that he made an offer to pay for the security so the taxpayers didn't have to foot the bill for, his, for, for, for the Met Police security that was stripped when he moved to America. But this legal fight is costing an awful lot of money because the Home Office aren't backing down. They're saying, you're not, we can't just have police as guns for hire. Any old oligarch or sheikh could come over and hire uh, you know, some top armed police if that was the case. But it's not going away. I think it's going to be heard in April and we may or may not find out before the coronation whether it's settled. It's cost us £300,000. but So far. So far. But he will, um, so we haven't had the trial yet. So remember the trial is going to be to take up, we're going to talk two or three times as much as 300,000. But when he comes to the coronation, if he comes to the coronation, he will get this armed protection that he wishes. It's the private going out to see friends, going out to see his charity that, that he's worried about. But it's, should we be paying for this and should we be paying for the legal fees? And it's interesting, obviously, his argument being that, yes, he can hire security um, people to protect him, but they don't have access to the intel, the intelligence yeah. that the Metropolitan Police have about the credible threats. And we know that they, they are credible mm -hmm. threats because the Met told us they're mm -hmm. credible threats. And, and those threats but might be even more real after the book and yeah, the, the revelations about the Taliban, etc. But it seems a bit weird that if the Met is saying you can have protection you know, if you're going to mm. a, a, a you know, uh, service that's that's part of your royal duties, or you know, but if you're going out for dinner, friends, we can't. But then surely those people who've been protecting him, let's say during the day, would brief the people who've been protecting him during the evening. Logically and logistically, both are, neither arguments really stack up to me, and it's I guess it, that's it, what the trial is about. It's just there. I mean, Andrew's had his stripped, and so he's no longer got armed police officers, but. Charles is funding some private security for him. So Andrew, you know, why should Harry have? Uh, Andrew's had threats. He's had people break into his house. Yeah. He's had all, you know, he's, he's had as bad press as Harry. So he's likely to have people wanting to, you know, do bad to him. But he doesn't have armed police. They just have. He has uh, security paid by Charles. But I think this, this, this threats are slightly different when it comes to Harry and Meghan. There have been for Andrew. There's m been much worse press for Harry and Meghan than there has been for Andrew. And again, there's been that racial element when it comes to Harry and Meghan as well. And I think you're absolutely right, Daisy, that it's the intelligence that I think Prince Harry wants to have access to. And you think to yourself, okay, if he, if he can't pay for that 
for that metropolitan police security, why can't there be more, for want of a better phrase, joined up thinking? So that's a, that intel can be passed on. But maybe that's an argument point as well, that the, me the metropolitan police are not willing to pass on their intelligence. If they did, perhaps they wouldn't still have this trial that's been dragging out and costing £300,000 in the first place. This could have been tied up and should have been tied up a lot earlier. We shouldn't still be here. The American cartoon South Park took aim at the Duke and Duchess of Sussex last week. The pair have responded, describing it as baseless and boring. It had been reported that Meghan was upset and overwhelmed by the cartoon. Um, what, what do you make of their response? Baseless and boring, Daisy. Does that lead us to think they're not going to sue over this, which had I been suggested? I very, very much doubt they will sue over this because that would be messy. Um, South Park will have been pretty careful. I mean, some of it was very sort of obvious. But, you know, they said, oh, it's not them. It's uh, the Canadian prince and press. And we all know it was them. Of course it was them. Uh, but they will make themselves look very stupid and how much money have they got for fighting all these you know, litigious court cases? So I'm certain they won't sue. And also, one thing that did strike me is, again, in Harry's book, he kept saying that the response when he said to the firm and to his family, why won't you protect Meghan from all these attacks she's having from the press and from social media and so on? And they said, well, you know, Kate and Camilla had the same. And he said, well, no, they didn't have it anywhere near as bad. Actually, Kate's and William's treatment by South Park was worse in many ways. I mean, it was much more disgusting <laughs> and base and offensive in many ways. So I think they've got to be very careful. There was a line from Meghan's lawyer uh, in the Meghan versus Samantha Markle case where he, he suggested that you can't litigate for every perceived slight. And I think that's yeah. perhaps a, a lesson they need to take I mean, on board themselves. Actually, this baseless and boring comment came from Harry and Meghan's lawyer over the suggestion that people had said that they would sue. And the lawyer said, no, why would they? This is a baseless and boring story. story. Yeah. Um, and so I think there has been no response from Harry and Meghan. I don't think there will be a response from Harry and Meghan. Of course they won't sue because I actually think they just don't really care that much. And I think... Does it say they're relevant still? I mean, does it I mean, suggest in, in actually way, it that, you know, because, because if, they're, if they're picked out by South Park to be featured, yeah, because is that, that a good thing? South Park are also using them for client. I mean, mm. South Park use what's going on in popular culture to write from their shows. And they're also very good at predicting the future. So I think they just kind of, you know, use what's been happening for their show. Harry and Meghan haven't really responded and I think that's why you kind of have these baseless and boring stories of they're going to sue or they're going to do this or Meghan was upset or anything else. We just, we haven't said anything, we don't know anything, people should stop making it up. I think the only negative that, um, that, that they might be considering is what does this tell us about the demographic that cares about us? Mm. Because before the demographics have been very, very clear, an older white demographic had become very anti Harry and Meghan, a younger and non-white demographic was still pretty much on side and weren't as negative. And it's just interesting that South Park is a much younger forum uh, and that seems to be becoming, the, uh, certainly South Park was being negative about them. Brutal that, in part. Br br brutal. Really. That could be interpreted as quite interesting demographically, but I don't, not, don't read too much into that. Well, that is all we've got time for this week. My thanks to Afia, Matt and Daisy. We will be back next week with all the latest on the Royal Family. Hope you can join us. We'll see you then.